Hey fellow tacticians, be sure to like this video and subscribe and ring that little notification bell. That supports this channel's conservative content, which is good for me, good for you, good for America, but really bad for the dark cyber overlords at YouTube. Just uh, taking a minute to introduce John Colquitt, who is with us tonight. He's a veteran preacher. Preaches now at uh, two or three different places, as a matter of Cold Springs. I know he did preach at Midway, and of course we all know his son, Caleb, who's been doing the lessons, and he's going to be, well, filling in is a good word, but uh, he's more than filling in, he's uh, filling up. So he's going to do a terrific job, and we're really glad to have him here. You can deactivate this one now because he's going to be live. Okay, I should be on now. There we go. It is great to be with you, and yeah, I have been introduced as Caleb's dad a good bit tonight, and uh, and that's fine. I understand that. Yeah, Caleb uh, started speaking when he was about five or six years old, I guess, and I'm glad we did those things because a couple of those kids ended up being preachers, so really glad to uh, be here with you, and I know a lot about the congregation, and I know also uh, when Caleb's had some challenges that y'all have been good to him and that I am most appreciative of because when he had cancer and was going through all of that I know how much the congregation did for him and to that I am eternally grateful to you and I'm glad to be here with you tonight and we're going to be in the second chapter of the book of Hebrews and actually that's the first Bible class that I ever had uh, when I was uh, going to Wetumpka and I was baptized there I was as an adult, I didn't grow up in the church, so you'll know a little bit about my background. Now, I live in Wetumpka. Uh, I'm from Titus, so I'm a country boy. You know, I asked Caleb ahead of time, I said, son, am I going to need to dress up to go up there? I'm not used to that, and that's fine if you do. Uh, I know how that goes. Uh, I always wore a suit when I was preaching, not because I liked it or because I even thought it was necessary, but because the little old ladies in that church thought their preacher ought to have a suit on. <laughs> so that's why I did that. I did it for their benefit as much as anything. So uh, I'm a retired agriculture teacher. I taught at Marbury High School and almost all my career. Uh, and now I work for Alabama FFA. Uh, I've got 14 counties and I visit uh, programs and I help young ag teachers because all of them are younger than I am. Uh, I have a unique kind of job. Tomorrow morning I'm teaching a parliamentary procedure team. Just to let you know a little bit of what I do, I'm taking, teaching a parliamentary procedure team. Then I'm going to a land judging contest. And after that, I'm going to a livestock show here in Montgomery. So that's a very day for me. That's, that's kind of how I roll with things. Uh, I do a lot of different things. And uh, I have been preaching for 27 years, and I still preach now. Um, and I taught at Faulkner for 10 years. Uh, I taught Bible courses over there, uh, went to school at Southern Christian. and um, So I really, uh, that's my background in it, and uh, have really enjoyed working in the church and the children growing up in it and everything. Um, I asked Caleb about the class because you got to know your audience, and so he said, they'll be sitting all over the place. Boy, he wasn't lying about that. I usually gather all my people together and get them in one spot so I can look at them. <laughs> And I can see y'all back there, but uh, he did say that that would happen. And I asked him also if y'all would talk. He said, well, it's a big auditorium. I don't know. I I'm accustomed to being a teacher. I was a class high school classroom teacher for a very long time. And I didn't ask people to talk or interject. I made them do it. And I hope I don't do that with y'all tonight. I don't want you to be uncomfortable or anything like that. But the only way I knew how to get anything out of a high school kid was to put them on the spot. And so I sort of forced them to do it, and I'm accustomed to doing that. And people, when I first started preaching, I did it like I did in high school. I called their names out from the pulpit. Now, to start with, it took them a while to get used to me. I'm an acquired taste, okay? And I hope I don't run anybody off because of this tonight. And you'll have Caleb back, and uh, I, I really am excited about the, the sections of Scripture that we're going to be on in Hebrews chapter 2. And I also want to mention this, too. We're helping with the Ukraine uh, work that you're doing. Uh, I'll be coming back later on this week. Uh, they're gathering some, some of the materials there tonight, and we're going to be coming back with some buckets, too. And I got a couple, some extra buckets tonight, so that's a good reason, too, for me to come down here because we're participating in that. And I know Caleb's been going over there for 
for several years now, so we wanted to participate in that and continue to pray for those folks because they're having a rough time, as y'all are well aware. And I know Caleb's been in touch with some of the people that he works has worked with over there uh, since all of this has been going on and uh, continue to pray for them for sure. Um, Caleb and I talked about this, about the book of Hebrews, and he and I got into a philosophical discussion about it. And one of the things that we brought up between the two of us, I've always said Hebrews ought to be before Matthew. He said, Dad, that wouldn't make any sense, and they wouldn't. If you're reading through the entire Gospels, then it wouldn't naturally be first. You wouldn't know who Christ was. But certainly, I think that Caleb's probably said this, and you probably believe this too, that Hebrews is the link between the Old and the New Testament. It is. It puts it, it, puts it together. It meshes those two things together. And I think that all of us can readily see that uh, to the audience to whom he is writing. You know, years ago, if we want to get an overview of what I think the overview of the book of Hebrews is before we get specifically into the chapters, um, and I did want to ask this too, and somebody can tell me this, what time should I shut up? No, that you don't tell me that. <laughs> I used to go 96 minutes in the classroom. That's not a good idea. But now, really, what, what time you can tell me? And it'll, I know we get a warning bell, a couple of them. Brother McKee already told me about that. And, um, and we were talking earlier about his, his uh, Patrick Henry, uh, what do you call it, act out. The, that, that was give me liberty, give me death. I, I mean, that was incredible. But um, we were talking about that. What time do I need to shut down, though? Do you all know? Ten after? Okay. That helps me because I've got a clock up here. Uh, if I were preacher here, Y'all would have a great big clock right back there so I could see it. It'd be this big. If you didn't have one, you'd buy it. <laughs> okay? Because <laughs> they always made sure I had a clock. I hope I'm not that bad, but uh, we'll try to shut down at the right time. And it won't hurt my feelings if you do that. Look, I was on a clock my whole life, so it will not hurt my feelings. That'll be fine. Um, but as we get into this, you know, to, to think about the overview of the entire book of Hebrews, I think of it like this. Several years ago, me and my dad went on a trip to Cooperstown, New York. Now, for those of you that are unwashed, that's where the Baseball Hall of Fame is, and I took my daddy there. Well, we were going up to Birmingham, and we were going to fly. My daddy had not flown since he was on an Army plane back in the 50s, so he had not been on one. Well, we missed the plane, and my daddy thought the trip was over. He thought, you know, son, he said, well, I guess we're just going to have to go home. And he's very anxious about time. We got up there early. This wasn't nowhere to park at that place. And I'm not accustomed to all that mess they got in Birmingham. And so we couldn't find it. And we missed the fight. And I talked to this little girl, and she helped us get our flight. And we flew somewhere else, and we actually made it there faster than we thought we were going to. It turned out fine. But my daddy was worried about it. He thought we were going to miss our destination. And you've got to stay on course wherever you're going, and it's a very simplistic analogy to give, but that, I think that's what Hebrews is about, is just staying on course. Because the Hebrew writer was worried about them getting off course. And we'll see that as we go through, and if you go ahead and turn to that chapter, uh, as far as the background information is concerned, Caleb's probably already covered that. Uh, but if you were going to give an overview of the entire book, he wanted them to take heed, to pay attention to uh, the things that they had heard and the things that they had learned. He was concerned about them drifting away. And as a result of that, that's why he is inspired to write this, not only to the Hebrew Christians then, but also to us as well, to hold on to that truth that they had, that they had discovered and that they made aware of about the Messiah coming and Christ being the Savior. We know today, when we think about it, and these people drifting away, today we think about there is a pressure to compromise truth. You can nod at me if you think that's right, if you don't do that. But I think we've got a lot of that going on. And I've been in the church myself since 1987. I've been a member of the church, and I've seen a lot of changes in that time. Some of you have been in a lot longer than that. And 
And I'm not saying you're doing it here. I don't know what you're doing, but I do know as a general population and people that call themselves Christian, I know there's been a great compromise on what truth is and how diligent you are supposed to be in following it. There's a pressure on that. People are trying to, we were just talking about that, are broadening their way to heaven. Make that thing as broad as you can. And you mentioned the passage a minute ago about how narrow it actually is and striving to get into that narrow. And that's what the Hebrew writer was worried about. And of course, we're accused, what? Being too narrow. You know, I'd rather be too narrow than too wide. Let that soak for just a minute. And I really do believe that way because... I think we've gotten to the point that we've overlooked that in concerning ourselves with numbers and sizes and all of those kind of things and, and drawing people and all of that. Um, the beauty of being a guest preacher, guest Bible school teacher is this. I'm not really worried about what I say as far as stepping on somebody's toes because I'm going to be out of here and Caleb will be back and y'all can fuss at him about how I was if you want to. <laughs> but as far as I'm concerned, I mean, I, I really am concerned about that in the church. And I think I know what kind of congregation you have here. I've been associated with it enough to, to know that. But we have been accused of being too narrow in the Lord's church. People will say, and this is what I'm building up to, and then we'll get into the text. There are a lot of people in this country that will say Jesus was a great prophet. A lot of people will say that. A lot of people will say he's a great teacher. He is somebody that you should listen to. Yet, they don't really believe in following what he said to do. And that is where the problem lies and where the rubber really meets the road. Now, the author's fear in this... the the writer of the book of Hebrews, that they'll hear and they've heard and they've learned, but they're not going to actually obey. Now, that's why this is also a contemporary book, too, because I think it fits. And, and I got to tell you, this particular chapter, I was glad I got it because I think it's one of the best ones in the entire New Testament. I do. Because as we get into some of the things here, it's going to be outstanding. Some of the truths that we learn. And imagine them hearing this for the first time and taking an evaluation of themselves. The author wasn't worried about them rebelling. He wasn't worried about them rebelling against the church or what they had believed. You know what he was worried about? Them being careless and lethargic. That's why that can hit us very, very close to home, can it? I think that's what he was worried about. They find out, of course, in this, in this overview, if you were going to summarize this in just a few words in a sentence, that Christ was the greatest, He was the highest, He was the best of all things, He was the creator, the sustainer, the redeemer, and the preeminent one. And that's a whole lot, isn't it, in one person that came in the flesh. If you had any a lack of conviction about who Christ was, then you don't, if you believe this book and believe what the inspired writer said, if you believe it, then you don't have to question Christ and who he was and what he did. He wasn't just a good prophet. He wasn't just a smart teacher. He wasn't just somebody that, that did some miracles. But he was all those things that I just mentioned. He was the absolute preeminent one. He's better than all of them. He became the high priest, which is, of course, emphasized in this book. So he was worried about them neglecting their salvation. Now, I don't know how y'all do with things, but this is how I typically do a class. Now, I've got a text right here in front of me. But I'd rather one of y'all read. Now, who, who's the best reader in here? I don't know who. The, I always get a kid to do this, and I always say, who's the best reader? You a good Bible reader? Do all you can? Good. I like the way he's dressed tonight. He is ready for St. Patty's Day. <laughs> and I'm glad of that. And if you would, and I like to have somebody to read, if you will. If you don't want to, all you got to do is tell me, no, it's not going to hurt my feelings. I won't get mad, I promise. And I don't think anybody else will in here either. If they do, that's their problem. 
Because if you don't want to, that's fine. But if I could get you to in your, your outside voice, where everybody can sort of hear it, and I'll, I'll follow along here with you, and we'll get into this as he is worried about them neglecting their salvation, where we'll begin. And, and I don't, I've got New American Standard here that I use, but I don't know what you're using there. As long as it's a good translation, that's fine, probably whatever it is. But we'll do uh, verse 1 in chapter 2, if you would share it with us. Okay, pay close attention or else we drift away. That's the way I envision this, what he's talking about. Pay close attention to those things that you have heard so that they wouldn't drift away from it, okay? So they wouldn't fall away from it. Now, we were talking about Calvin just a few minutes ago, Brother Bob, and so many people are drawn to Calvinism, which there is no drifting away in their mind, but this passage if you couldn't if it wasn't possible to happen why did he say it he, he wouldn't would he how can you drift away from something if it's not possible but in that passage we see else we drift we have to pay attention to what is going on in our individual lives we have to do that so that's the first attention in this chapter it heightens our awareness to what is going on in our lives and think about what you're doing and where you are. This is a self-evaluation chapter, too. Okay. Now, what I'd like for some... Somebody else, would, would you like to read? I would appreciate it. Go ahead. Thank you, sir. For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Okay. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. All right. The word spoken through angels proved unalterable, something you can't change. And, you know, Paul said that, too. We know he wrote in places where he said, no matter who comes and says anything different than what we've said, don't believe it. All right? Pointing out here, the word spoken through angels proved unalterable, and then he talks about, and I've got a problem with this, and I want you to interject in this. I would appreciate it uh, to help me understand better. In the next sentence that he says there, every transgression and disobedience received a just penalty. What's he referring to there? Individually, as a person, as a congregation, or what is he talking about? What do you think? You know, it's, he points it out. He's here from inspiration. And certainly pointing out that and we know this from our Bible knowledge. God knows everything we do. God sees everything we've done. God knows every thought we have. And then he talks about a just penalty here. Is he talking about just to them, or is this an evaluation on us as individual Christian people? It's the individual or a group of people. Okay. Okay. See, this is an evaluation verse. Now, he's just told us you don't need to drift away. And as a group or as an individual, either one, I think you're right, can certainly look at it that way. You know, part of being a Christian is a continual evaluation process of your own lives and your own, your own motives and, and why you do things. That's what we're really all about. And certainly that's one of the things that, that Christ taught too. Okay. Now, we go to verse 3, um, and in this particular one, now this is a famous passage. Uh, this is one that's been used by a whole bunch of preachers a lot of times, me included, but many others that were lots better than me have used this passage. Somebody want to share it with us? How shall we escape if we neglect so, so great a salvation? Okay. Pointing out the fact, if we go back over it some, we can't leave a great salvation. You can't leave the best thing in your life. The thing that makes, there was a gentleman that used to end his prayers. He was a, a man that I admired a great deal. He always ended his prayer this way. He said, 
In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who makes life worth living and living worthwhile. That's a pretty good way to end a prayer, isn't it? Did that every time. Outstanding preacher, too. Uh, congregation in Clanton. Close to Clanton, yeah. Um, you don't neglect a great salvation. And how can you escape what's going to happen if you try to neglect it? Now, I don't know much about how, who attends here, who's been in and out, and that kind of thing, but in the last year, and I don't mean in a literal sense, but I'm betting you this, there have been people that used to go here that's not going here anymore. Am I right? And you folks are the Wednesday night people. You are ridiculously dedicated. I mean, there's a whole lot of folks that you'll see Sunday that you won't see tonight. And I'm not judging them on their reasons or anything. Sometimes I don't get to go either. But y'all have had people, everybody in the church, I've always known, and everybody says this, every preacher <laughs> always says this, boy, we'd have a whole lot of folks if everybody would stay that, that has come at one time. Have they neglected their salvation? I don't know. But we have the uh, opportunity to stay with it or neglect it. There's no question about that. And it's been given by Christ. And it's been confirmed by those who heard his message. If you look in that, that verse there, that's a great verse in your Bible. If you haven't highlighted it, highlight it. That's a commit to memory verse. It really is outstanding. Now, verse 4, as we look at it, and if I could have me a reading person, see, there's a strategy I'm using here. If I've got somebody to read, then I can listen to what you're saying, and I do better like that. Anybody like to read verse 4? God also bearing witness with them both by signs and wonders and by manifold powers and by gifts of the Holy Spirit according to His own will. Okay. God confirmed it. Confirm what had been said, all the things that had been said about Christ. All those things had been confirmed. And look at the different ways in which they had been confirmed. What does he say? By what? God first. Then what does he say? Wit say it louder for me. Please. Signs and wonders and miracles. Okay, those are all distinctively different things. Signs, wonders, miracles. Okay. As a result, these things are not just fanciful, fanciful stories that have been made up, but they're real things. They have been confirmed in a number of ways. When you're building up a case for evidence in a courtroom, you want to have a lot of different angles to go from to be able to prove your case. And that's what he's doing here. And he doesn't want them to neglect their salvation. So... That reminds us, and those things have been done, and it goes back to inspiration. We all know 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, by an inspiration and how vital that is and, and verifying what they said. This isn't just literature that somebody made up and wrote like a novel. It isn't like that. It's been confirmed in all of those ways. Because they had people in their day that were eyewitnesses to the things that had transpired with the beginning of the church, the miracles of the apostles, some of them were alive when Christ was alive in the flesh here on earth. There were other signs, and the Holy Spirit validated it as well. This is one of those chapters that you can go to. I've got a situation right now at my own house. I've got a foreign exchange student living with me. He's from Spain. He's Catholic, sort of. Uh, there's a lot of sort of Catholics. When you ask them if they are, they say, well, I'm Catholic. He says Catholic. He he's going to live with us until May. And he's been to church with me, sat in my Bible class. We've done that at home and that kind of thing. But I'm getting a trend. We, I've also had a, a kid from Italy and France. And these folks in Europe, they take the Bible as a really good book. 
that should be studied, but should never be taken literally in whatsoever. I'm going to take him to that great big boat in Kentucky before he leaves here. The ark, I'm going to take him up there. Because, and, and he's pretty vehement, he's pretty adamant about his, his belief, and that just, the Noah's ark does not make any sense. I said, well, how does this whole thing existing make any sense? And, of course, he goes back to the Big Bang, and I say, that's the silliest mess I've ever heard of in my life. And I got a science degree, and yes, it's from Auburn, but we learned some stuff in spite of what some of you might think. <laughs> we did. You know, I, I, I've had some science classes too. And even before I was so convinced the Bible was right, the Big Bang was stupid. I mean, it was. It's just stupid. I used to tell my kids in class that. That's the silliest thing of nothing coming from budding together and all that. But he really is, isn't bought in. I said, why don't you just read the Bible yourself? He said, I cannot understand the Bible. I said, yeah, you can. It's not that hard. People have been conditioned to believe they can't really understand it. And they shouldn't believe necessarily what they are reading. That's Europe. But you know what? That's Montgomery County, too. More and more by the day. Isn't it? I'm in high schools all the time. I never thought I would see some of the things I see and hear some of the things I'm hearing now. And I've been around kids all my life. It has changed dramatically in the last six years since I've been out. Directly in the classroom every day. It is absolutely amazing in our public schools, probably in the private schools too. They're not necessarily going to be any better from a moral standpoint. But I, I, I hear that. Uh, but these things have been confirmed by the Holy Spirit, by the miracles, by the signs, and all of those things. Now, verse 5, if somebody share that with us. For he did not subject angels to the world to come, concerning which we are speaking. Okay. Somebody please tell me, you've been a Bible student longer than me. What do you think he's talking about there? Why does he bring in angels into it? Or the world to come? He's better than that. And he draws what we said in the beginning in the introduction, that Jesus is better than the angels, better than anybody that's prophets that have come before. He's better than any high priest we've ever had. And even if it's a messenger from the heavenly throne of God... And that's where he came from anyway. And I think Hebrews gets into that too. Of course, the Gospel of John does, putting Christ into a cosmic perspective, not just beginning with Adam, but beginning before time ever began, before he was always there. Okay, thank you. All right, let's look at verse 6. Uh, this is a reference here to the Old Testament. This is a translation I have, but one has testified somewhere saying, and look at this passage. We've heard it before from the Old Testament. He says, what is man that you remember him? And where'd that come from? Some Bible student in here ought to know where that came from. What is man that you remember him or the son of man that you are concerned about him? Anybody know where that came from? Psalms what? Very good. Yeah, we've heard that before. Sometimes I'll go back and pick up something that was already inspired and write it and carry it forward, but it fits, doesn't it? That's an incredible statement. You know, I always told my young people, uh, it's always been funny to me, and maybe the, you haven't had this experience, but I always have. Why is it in high school, I knew everybody above me and in my grade. But the little people under me, I didn't hardly know them at all. That's true, isn't it? I mean, I saw a lot of kids that way, those little ninth graders, acting like they were older than they were because they were 15, I guess, or something. Uh, we didn't even, you didn't concern yourself with people that were two or three, one or two or three years younger than you when you were in school because they weren't in, that important. I think there's a genuine, 
I've had enough experience with it to know that that could be the case. Now, as a result of that, that you would be with him. Now, God is concerned with us. And that's pointing out in that passage, each and every individual one of us, the hairs on our head, the whole thing, he is aware of us here right now. And I forget to be concerned about things myself that I should. But it's hard to imagine that the king of the universe is concerned about me. Now he goes on in verse 7, if you will. This is talking about Christ. You have made him for a little while, made him for a little while, lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor and have appointed him over the works of your hands. Now, that also elevates in our mind what Christ was. Because he says there, you made him a little lower than, than the angels. All he did was take him out of heaven. Isn't that true? He took Christ out of heaven, a little lower than the angels, and then crowned him with glory and honor. When he goes back to heaven, he's elevated back again to the throne of God. And he was appointed over the works of your hands. That elevates Christ in a magnificent way. So verse 7, Christ is glorified. Christ is honored. Think for just a moment, if you will, before we go to verse 8. Think just a moment and imagine this, and I'm an imaginary person. I used to play Cowboys and Indians and Spider-Man and Superman and all that stuff. Use your imagination here for a minute. Think back as you were a child. Use that imagination. Think about this. Can you imagine, it's hard for us to imagine anyway, but can you imagine what heaven was like when Christ went back? Think, think of what that was like. He'd gone to earth, he carried out the mission, then he goes back to heaven. Well, he was the most glorified being beside God in heaven. That was the greatest celebration that had ever been. So when we consider that, all things were with him. Look at verse 8. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. For in subjecting all things to him, he left nothing that is not subject to him. But now we do not yet see all things subject to him. Now, what is he talking about there? All right. Everything, where if you think about the greatest religious, those that have the greatest impact in the history of the world, okay? You've got Moses, David, you got Muhammad, Confucius, you got all those people. We question those folks, and there are reasons why we question Muhammad and Confucius and Mahatma Gandhi, all of those folks, we question them because of the flaws that they had and because they lacked the supernatural nature of God that Christ had, right? He's saying here that everything is subject to him. Everything that we see is subject to Christ. Everything that we see in nature, between the animals, in industry, in business, in government, and all of those things, every bit of it is subject to him. Okay? Y'all tell me where I'm wrong, because I'm not on that. Everything's subject to him. And there's even things that we don't even know about that's subject to him. Isn't that what he's saying in the last phrase there? But now we do not yet see all things subject to him. So not everything that we see is subject to him, but we don't even know what it is. Okay. We look at verse 9. And it says, but do we see him 
who was made for a little while lower than angels, namely Jesus, finally get his name here of who he's talking about. We've gone the first several verses, the first eight verses, and it hasn't mentioned his name yet in this passage. But now we get his name. So there's no confusion here. We get his name because of the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. Now this is where any preacher that's worth his salt can make a plea. And if he can't convict your heart with that statement, then you can't be convicted. And what I mean by that is this. He tell you, that's my first one, isn't it? I got five minutes, is that what we're saying? Okay. He was crowned with honor and glory by the grace of God that he might taste death for everyone. Now this is where we get, none of us have earned our salvation. I've never seen a member of the church that said we earned it. And we don't have to back off on that. Now, one thing that gets on my nerves is when somebody, I say you need to be baptized, you need to live right and all that, you know what they'll say? Well, you don't understand. And I'm talking about somebody that had his doctorate in theology that was in a church. Well, you don't understand the grace of God. First of all, I don't like anybody telling me what I know. I mean that. I mean, you can ask me and I'll tell you, and I could be wrong about something. There's no question about that. But don't tell me what I know or don't tell me what I don't understand. Because of that, he thinks I don't understand the grace of God. Because I think, and y'all have heard that before. So you believe somebody has to be baptized. Well, yeah, I do. <laughs> well, you don't understand the grace of God. I, how many of y'all been told that before? <laughs> I mean, I have. It's interesting talking to preachers. We're hard-headed a lot. Uh, but he tasted death for everyone. And if you can culminate a sermon right there, you can prick somebody's heart. Look at verse 10. For it was fitting for him, for whom all things, and through him, or through whom all things, and bringing in many sons to glory, to perfect, to perfect the author of their salvation through sufferings. Our salvation was made possible through the sufferings of Christ. And that's why he was glorified. So, as we consider those things in verse 10, he was the, first of all, I gleaned from that, he's the only one that could do it. And everything that was done was through him and by him. And because of that, many were brought to him. And salvation comes through his suffering. Salvation doesn't come through our suffering. Even though we do suffer, we have difficulties and challenges in life. We have a, a body that has a finality to it. Then in verse 11, for both he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified. So he who sanctifies, that's Christ, and those who are sanctified are all from one Father, so those that say that Christ, and there are those out there that say Christ wasn't the real one, and they'll, they'll make accusations. And I used to work in service stations where we had people of Islam, and they say, y'all believe in three gods? And I said, no, we don't. And we get into those situations. But we come from one Father, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. And we are invited to be in the family of God. That's what's meeting here tonight. You ever felt like sometimes it didn't act like the family of God? <laughs> On occasion, uh, verse 12, this is what he says, I will proclaim your name to my brethren in the midst of the congregation. I will sing your praise. There's an advocate there, isn't there? Verse 13, and again, I will put my trust in him. And when you say your prayers and you read your Bible and you have those quiet times, remember that's what life is all about, is putting your trust in him. And again, behold, 
I and the children whom God has given me. Now, there's some, of course, that'll say, see, that's where God chose everybody that was going to be saved ahead of time. But it's always a choice by the individual person. It was never forced on anyone. Verse 14, Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil. Now, there's a whole lot of doctrine in verse 14. Siblings share blood and flesh. Christ shared that flesh and blood, and he has the ability to destroy the devil as a result of that. And we'll conclude with verses 15 and 16 as we read it together. And he might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery in all their lives. Or assuredly, he does not give help to angels, but gives help to the descendants of Abraham, and that's us. Therefore, he had to be made like his brethren in all things, so that he may become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make the propitiation of sins for the people or of the people. Now, I'm going to conclude right there because I think I'm supposed to. But that is a worthy chapter of our study and our attention. And for a lot of you, I know it's probably a refresher. But as they used to say in the 60s, that's some pretty heavy stuff in that little passage, isn't it? It's worthy of our time and attention. And I do love the book of Hebrews. I'm glad uh, if Caleb had me to... to uh, Take his spot for one evening. That would be a good one for me to do. And I appreciate being here with you tonight. Ever wonder where Superman gets his incredible powers? Some people say it's the yellow sun of Earth, but I think it's because he subscribes to this channel and likes my videos. Now, I'm not saying that if you subscribe to my channel, you'll necessarily wake up tomorrow as a super strong, nearly invincible alien, but it definitely doesn't hurt your chances.